So, uh, I am going to hopefully not overload you with theory, but I'm going to have to give you a little bit of background theoretical psychology to help you make sense of another dimension which relates to kind of the internal conflicts and the way in which we can be autonomous and independent when it comes to tackling some of these internal conversations that we have and internal blockages that we can have. This is a framework, it's called transactional analysis. Um, it's called transactional analysis because it studies the subtle psychological transactions between the different parts of us and the different parts of another person. So you might have heard of Freud who has this classification of ego, super ego and id. And this is a theoretical breakdown of what I call me. But in transactional analysis, we have this idea that me is in fact not a theoretical breakdown of different parts of me, there are phenomenological parts of me. So parts of me that have emerged based on the actual shaping of my environment, literally like a sponge, we've sucked up certain things, certain traits, qualities, personalities, based on the very real experience of our childhood. So we have the inner child, which is the first part to develop chronologically. So that is literally, and if you really want to go deep into the matrix, the first part of the child is the, the, the tabula rasa, as we would say in, in Latin, which is the free child, the clean slate, that hasn't yet been adapted and molded by its environment. And then the second part that develops is the adapted child. Adapted, not in general, adapted to its specific environment. If you are a child that grew up in a very abusive environment, you develop an adaptation to that abusive environment Typically, as an adult, you thrive in situations where you have to survive, but you're not, ever, ever, you're not ever really able to live because you weren't equipped for non-dramatic situations. So, again, emphasis on adapted to its environment. So this is the first part of you that developed between the ages of typically zero and five, six years old. This is really when this part of you is being molded. And... Unlike Freud, who says, we all have an id, we all have an ego and a superego, and they are very similar regardless of who you are, this accounts for a huge amount of diversity between people. As there's my brother, we both have inner child, we have the same biological parents, but his inner parent, which is the second part that develops, is not the same as my inner parents. They might share traits because similar environment, but still different. So this is what I mean with phenomenological instances and not theoretical instances. So basically, inner child, then inner parent develops because this inner child, or this child before it was an inner child, is supported and guided and nurtured by typically adults or peers. Inner parent is a simplification. This could be the internalization of your older siblings, your teachers, your neighbors, whoever has had a significant impact in shaping your representation of the world, the law, yourself, values, etc. So basically, this is, if you had to summarize it, this is what you interpreted and recorded from the adults around you that shaped the should level. So another way that you can look at this simply is, this is the part of you that wants, this is the part of you that tells it, itself, I should do this, I feel that this is right, this is wrong, and the last part that develops is the inner adult, which is the part that actually has choice and typically mediates between these instances. I'm going to give you like the full complexity, and if you're interested in this, you can do a bit more digging. If you look at how the inner parent is divided, it is typically divided into the critical parent, which um, we would see as the, the internal police officer, and then you would have the supportive parent, which is the part of you that is typically nurturing, reassuring, loving. It's, the, it's going to be all right, baby love. Don't worry about it. You've got this. Versus the, this is terrible. You should never do that. You're, uh, you need to do something to make up for your actions. You should feel terrible, whatever it is. So you can see how already there is the potential for conflict just inside of you between these different parts of you. And... The way that I encourage you to think about this metaphorically is imagine that you have all these different versions of you sitting around a round table with slightly different needs and agendas, right? The inner kid typically doesn't really care about what it should be doing. It wants what feels good. It wants what is fun. 
And it's also pure. It typically is loving unless given a reason not to. Um, it's typically trusting unless given a reason not to. And it's globally optimistic because, I mean, life hasn't kicked the shit out of it yet, to put it in plain English. So there are interests that might be conflicting between these different parts of you. We've encouraged you to presence each other and take the time to find ways to address, you know, to understand the needs and to understand the different dynamics with another person. But you can also do this to a great extent within yourself, as long as you understand that it's not supposed to be coherent. There is not one you, that doesn't make you schizophrenic, but there are parts of you with different needs at different times. And you, when you are doing this, when you take this meta level of reflection, you are positioning yourself in your inner adult and you have the possibility to give weight, to give a voice, to put the focus on these different parts of you and to question whether there is any conflict, any antagonism or any friction between these different parts of you. And how could there not be? You, know, you all want a lot of things, but reality is a very frustrating place. Uh, so you're necessarily going to have to constantly negotiate inside of yourself implicitly between what you feel that you should be doing and what you actually want to do or what you're able to do, quite the limitations as well. Um, and if we remember now, why is this called transactional analysis? Well, whenever you're talking to someone, you are talking to someone who has an inner parent, an inner adult and an inner child. And you can relate on different levels. When you are with your partner and you are having this playfulness, this, you know, uh, kind of like fun interactions or you play together, you could say you are connecting child to child. It is your inner child connecting to their inner child and that is the, 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 the way in which the relationship is experienced. Those parts are actually connecting. Same situation. Let's imagine, you know, we're still talking about a romantic partnership. You can also be, and this sounds unhealthy but it isn't necessary, you can also be connected from parent to child. This is the moment where, for example, my partner would come home from work. Um, she's a criminal lawyer, so I let you imagine in what state she gets home from work sometimes. Um, and sometimes she needs to be taken care of. She comes home, her and her child is pissed off, disappointed, exhausted, and just like done with life. Um, and in that moment, I would be more likely to take on the slightly parental role, but not because I'm objectifying her or because I consider myself superior, but just because in that moment, I've got nurturing, I've got nurturing energy left. I can be supportive. And in that moment, her inner child needs a hug, a hot chocolate, and you know, essentially the permission to go to bed at nine o'clock if she needs. And so you can have, for the same romantic partnership, you can have a parent-child relationship, and it can switch. In an ideal world, if you're in a healthy relationship, you have mobility. You can connect child to child, you can connect parent to child in whatever way, and you can connect parent to parent. This is, in transactional analysis, they call this the PTA meetings from, you know, in America, it's the parent meetings where all the parents get together and, you know, they talk about like, oh yeah, the school is terrible and this is the world, our oh, young people nowadays, you know, this is two shoulds meeting each other so they can agree or disagree. Very often political conversations end up being parent to parent. Oh, you know, that, that it shouldn't be so materialistic, the world. Oh, you know, we're much too superficial. Yes, I agree. Or uh, conflicting, like, oh, I believe that the, we should liberate the market even more and just make everyone an entrepreneur and be like, no, I think we should go towards communism and have a strong state that makes everything fair and regulates the market. Then we've got our two inner parents actually disagreeing because we have two different shoulds in the back of our minds. And what we're doing right now in this type of setting is we are connecting mostly adult to adult. We're mostly connected in the pragmatic, meta, uh, rational sense of the term where we are trying to approach things in the most logical way possible and where there are emotions, but it's not a mostly emotional place. It's mostly a pragmatic place, but this requires more energy. This is the, it requires the most conscious energy because it, you have to kind of do it deliberately and it is draining in itself beyond the fact that you have to choose to do it. Um, it's more tiring because there are no easy fixes. This always ends up with some kind, some kind of statement like, oh, well, it depends, it's a complex thing, we need to look at it in different ways. Whereas these guys typically have very extreme views of like, it's terrible, it's black and white. So this whole framework is interesting because it gives you a way to look at yourself 
and to kind of presence yourself. Um, and it also helps you to potentially make sense of the discrepancies that you might pick up in other people. Because at one point or in one situation, you might see my inner parent transpire more in something related to judgment, for example. In other cases, you might see my enthusiasm and my like joy and lust for life shine through, and that might be more of an expression of my inner child. So different contexts will bring to the, to the front, to the forefront, a different aspect of you. Um, so that already in itself should be useful at the level of awareness and insight. Okay, I shouldn't expect myself to be completely coherent all the time. It doesn't make me crazy or schizophrenic, but there are literally different parts of what I call me, different versions of me, all around the table. And my inner adult, my deliberate conscious self, is trying to make sure they're not all killing each other, and if possible, pulling in the same direction in a way that doesn't have terrible consequences on my life. Um, you can deliberately seek out, you can presence different parts of these, of yourself, in different ways. Um, journaling is one of the ways that you can do that. You could, if, if any of you already have journals, you could try and do a division based on what does my inner parent sense and feel about this, and what does my inner child sense and feel about this? And you will find very often that initially it looks like there's a huge conflict, but not necessarily. In terms of a very common thing that you will observe as well, is that you might feel that you should do something, but actually, when you really put your inner adult on the case, when someone else presences you, or when you take the time to really journal, think it out through, and read yourself, not just write, close the journal, but make sure you're rereading yourself afterwards, or recording yourself, you don't need to even write it, but you might find that actually your shoulds are not that definitive and firm. A lot of times we feel much more trapped than we actually are. We typically have many options, and typically we don't like most of the options that we have, but we have options. So the kind of breaking things down in this way and seeking out specific needs related to these parts can help you to actually feel less stuck and basically that you don't necessarily have to do everything you feel that you should. Um, it can also help clarify what you want. A very, another very common experience, which is actually quite heartbreaking, is most people unlearn to make space and, and uh, give a voice to their inner child, and they lose stuff like, I don't really know what I want anymore, I never really want anything, because that part of them has been left out of the conversation, that hasn't been encouraged. We don't live in a society, even in Scandinavia, where you know we're very open and advanced and tolerant and humane in many respects there's still a culture of like nah this is like not the useful part of you like focus on focus on this like this is not really as valuable this is nice to have but like nah it's not really productive so you know at the, at the end of the day um yeah just make sure the kid is there just not not disturbing anyone but not taking up too much space um so some people need to deliberately work on getting the kid out of the basement and be like, okay, well, so we've been neglecting you for years. Um, sorry about that, but okay, let's maybe give you a bit more of a voice in the conversation and maybe you can actually help with stuff like motivation because different parts are motivated by different things. I'm sure you all have experiences with extrinsic motivation of, ah, I should do something and I'm gonna try and force myself to do it. How great is that motivation? How, lo how long does it last over time? It's, it's, it works, but it's not the best motivation you can tap into. Intrinsic motivation, the activity that is its own reward, doing something because it feels good, much stronger motivation over time. And that's where you need your inner child, for example, at work, to help you understand what enthuses you and what gives you passion and the energy to tolerate all the other frustrations that are going to basically come along with that. So a few different ways, a few different concrete examples of how this can be used for self-reflection, for understanding yourself, for understanding other people, and it gives you a diagnostic map of the direction of relationships as well. You might find that, oh, with my partner, it works great when we're child to child, it works okay when I'm the parent and my partner's the child, but it never wor I never let myself be parented by my partner. There's something about that specific direction that does not work. And it's interesting to see that because it makes it, it circumvents the problem to something relatively fixable and concrete, instead of just having this general sense of, my relationship is nice sometimes, and other times it feels like shit, but I don't really understand what makes it switch from one to the other. So having this as a diagnostic lens is potentially quite interesting. 
And yeah, so journaling exercises could be built around this. Um, at the very least, I would encourage you to take away that you have these different parts of you. Inevitably, they're gonna be different. They change over time. The relationship between these different parts of you can change over time. And at the very least, when you're feeling stuck, when you're feeling uncomfortable, when you're feeling that your blue needs to be addressed, there's something, it's not, it's not about the other person, it's really on you. Visualize this mental meeting. Have a mental retro with yourself and have some fun with it. You don't have to take it too seriously. You could personify, if you're designers, you could literally design a little, um, like a profile for all these different parts of you. I, I know, if I, if I might snitch on my brother here for a minute, um, I know that Estev has done this where he's personified his inner Estevs and in, in, he's, been, he's added more than just like a parent, a supportive parent, supportive, a critical parent, supportive parent, adapted child, free child and adult. I don't know how many inner Estevs you have at, at this point in time. Too many. Too many. <laughs> and that might be the problem. But um, you can have fun with it, you can be creative with it and it's, it's a symbolic lens to look at things through. But in my experience this is very useful because it already helps to reduce the complexity of interactions. And again, it, how miraculous is it that we understand each other at all when we realize that there are three of us constantly talking to three of anyone else and that we're trying to get something done. Like, isn't that amazing that anything gets done at all? It's surprising that, you know, we don't just, yeah, burst into flames, essentially. So <laughs> this is, I think, obviously it's a simplification of reality. There's much more literature on this. There's a breakdown of the different types of transactions and games and patterns that can emerge as a result of this, if you're interested in really yeah, going deeper into the matrix. But hopefully this is enough to give you something actionable and useful. Do we have any questions about this at this stage?